hello everyone welcome to one more webinar on a new webinar series today we're going to talk about wildfire remediation post fire response and regeneration a permaculture perspective we have crew from ecosystem restoration community with us the soil food lab team and matthew as our special guest as well as always, chime in the chat where are you guys coming from. We love to see that. We know that there are people from everywhere around the globe. And we are glad to have you here once more. Like always, too fast to read. So Germany, California, Colombia, Missouri, Hawaii, Greece. Thank you, everyone. Zambia as well, France. So pretty much every continent. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. So let's start because there is a lot of good topics to cover today. Okay, as always, just to reveal uh, our instructions, uh, you will be muted for the duration of the webinar so we can ensure good audio quality for everyone. Please enter your questions for the panelists in the Zoom Q&A session is located at the bottom of the Zoom window. And we have amazing staff collecting your questions and we're gonna talk about them in the second half of the session. Converse with the other attendees in the chat. It's a lot of fun. We exchange a lot of great experiences. So have fun, enjoy this time. Okay, let's cover the topics for today. Uh, we're gonna go for a quick introduction then we're going to have Matthew Trump presenting the, about the post-fire response regeneration, a permaculture perspective. Then we're going to hear from Ashley Brown, the introduction to ecosystem restoration course. After that, we will move to Q&A with the panelists. And the total time for today is about one hour and a half. Okay, so let's start the introductions. Dr. Elaine? Thank you, Carla. Um, I'm Dr. Elaine Ingham. I am the founder of um, the, the craziness that's going on around here. <laughs> um, I have a degree and my PhD is in um, soil microbiology. Um, you know, just standard, um, typical academic going through the steps uh, along the way um, until I finally thought going on my own and being able to talk to whoever I wanted to talk, get together with them, um, that was po now possible. So that started back in about um, um, 1995, 96, um, fully committed to doing the, um, you know, the reality uh, end of things instead of the uh, so much the academic in uh, 2002. Uh, I've been all over the world ever since that, um, talking to people in nearly every continent of this planet. And we, um, what you realize is that you do have to understand the local problems, the um, the way the uh, different ecosystems work in those different situations. So I get to be a panelist today. So um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Matthew. Um, so he can tell him tell us about him. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Trum, and I'm currently living in Berry Creek, California. Uh, it's a, one of the places that is a, in a burn scar here in Butte County in California. Uh, I'm a permaculture educator and consultant, and um, I have been dedicating my life to teaching as many people as I can um, about living systems and permaculture design. And, um, you know, I run a bunch of different programs here in Butte County, including a K through eight school garden program, which is probably one of my most proud things that I do. Um, and, uh, you know, inspiring people to create, you know, their own systems on their own properties um, or their communities and, you know, basically just having a network of demonstration sites because it's all about 
the demonstration sites and um, the on the ground work. Um, you know, I, I want to get people into action. You know, I want to pe get people inspired and out there and doing stuff. And I want to support them through their journey. That's what, what I do. And that's who I am. Is it my turn? Yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ashley Brown. And I am the education coordinator at Ecosystem Restoration Communities. Uh, and I'm here because the ERC is our acronym. We have partnered with the Soul Food Web School to develop a suite of courses about the restoration of different ecosystems. Um, and the introduction to ecosystem restoration course is our first course, becoming more and more prevalent. And it's an honor to be here and part of such an important topic. And I look forward to talking to you all a bit later on. Thank you, Elaine, Matthew, and Ashley. And it's my honor to be here hosting this panel with a lot of knowledge. So being here absorbing everything, it's a pleasure and an honor. I'm a lead scientist in research at the Dr. Elaine Soifu Web School. Uh, my PhD is in environmental sciences and this connection with education is a constant in my entire career. And I'm also living in Oregon, US, so, but raised in Brazil. This is why is the accent. So bear with me a little bit here. So without further ado, let's uh, give Matthew the round and take control, Matthew. All righty. Here we go. So I just first want to say I'm, I'm super grateful to be here and um, share my experience and um, just share uh, my journey and, uh, you know, what I've learned and what, you know, there's been a lot of lessons. Uh, one of the titles, you know, when my description was lessons of humility, because um, there's a lot of that. And uh, in permaculture, we say, you know, accept feedback, respond and change. Um, it's really important to always have that in your head when you're doing stuff, because um, every scenario is going to be different. Uh, as Elaine kind of pointed out earlier, um, all different ecosystems everywhere you are is different and uh, different people, different living systems. Um, so we always are. That's why we call ourselves practitioners in permaculture, um, because, you know, we're always learning and uh, and growing and, uh, and it's OK to make mistakes. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Uh, for inviting me to do this, Elaine and, and Soil Food Web team. Um, so I'm going to go really quick through um, an introduction of myself as far as, you know, some of my journey. Um, if you want more of that, you can uh, look. I have posted my bio in the comments. So if you wanted to click on that at some point in the webinar and then, you know, like you can check out a bunch of stuff there. And there's like videos in there and there's a lot of articles on my work. Um it's been quite the journey, to say the least. <clears throat> so this was me about 13 years ago. Fifth, no, gosh, 15 now. Okay, I've been, been doing this presentation for a while uh, with this photo. So I was actually a hip-hop DJ um, in the Bay Area. And, um, you know, I got pretty good at that. That's what I, when I get into something, I get really, really into it. Um, and so I was performing with uh, big artists. I performed for Farside um, and, you know, some other big artists in the Bay Area and things like that. Um, so here's the Bay Area, right, where I lived. Densely packed, you know, urban area. Uh, every time I go back, it's it's crazier. And then I moved in 2007 to the mountains of uh, Berry Creek. And a uh, much different place here, um, <laughs> very rural. Um, and, uh, you know, that's where my journey kind of changed. Um, I was, you know, grew up going up there, some pictures of me as a boy um, with my family uh, up on the property. So my folks had bought land in 1985 in Berry Creek, and uh, I'd gone there many times, and I had an opportunity in 2007 to help tend the land there. And um, it's off grid. Um, it was, uh, yeah, heavily forested, you know, logging, 
uh, regrowth forest. Um, and uh, <clears throat> just to give you a little perspective, this is before the fire, um, our land up there. And, uh, you know, we did do some defensible space clearing, as you can see here. Um, and we had a lot of experience with, um, you know, doing uh, the wrong things as well. Um, neighbors above me, you see this big chunk. Uh, it was 25 acres that was clear cut um, in, I think, 2003. And so I was able to see what ha what happens uh, when when you clear cut a, a large area like that, of course, they don't call that clear cutting even um, anymore. But, um, you know, wind erosion um, and then watching the regrowth. That was a, a big thing for me. Um, there's a picture of our, the house up there um, and the property. Yeah, some solar panels were fully off grid. Um, so I was more of a prepper mentality. But part of that was you know, growing food. And that's what dipped my toe into this world. I started growing food, um, you know, had a little greenhouse and, you know, was just cutting my way into uh, into the forest a little bit to create a little bit more um, defensible space. And as I'm in my journey, I read this book, Once for All Revolution, highly recommend it. And uh, it was the first taste of, you know, what uh, what he calls natural farming, but uh, ecological based, um, you know, approach to providing for oneself. Okay. And, and thinking like nature. And that was um, my first film, Matsubanu Fukuoka. It was the name of this farmer. And uh, it was a huge inspiration for me. And it set me down a, a journey. Um, I also then got this book. I, I was starting to do research, um, Edible Forest Gardens, uh, was a was a first read for me, and that was blowing my mind. Um, understanding how things connect, but very much, you know, focused on like techniques and stuff. Um, didn't know anything about design or big picture kind of stuff. I was still uh, DJing, and I, I actually was MC and rapping for a while, so I was still doing that in, intermixed. And one day, I heard this word permaculture online, and you know, started my my, uh, I guess, you know, big explosion of this new thing. And um, the more I looked into it, the more I, I was like, wow, this is the Holy Grail. This is what I've been kind of trying to figure out my whole life. Um, and this is what I want to do with my life. Um, this picture of me and Jeff Lawton in Nevada, where I met Jeff uh, the first time in a presentation in Reno. And um, I was inspired. I, I've been watching Jeff Lawton's videos. Like many people, he was my introduction to permaculture for the most part. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he inspired me. And uh, I ended up taking my permaculture design course. Um, graduated in 2015 uh, with that. And almost simultaneously, because as I'm learning and really like in, into this new thing, um, and I'm, this is my that permaculture explosion. This is my daughter, <laughs> uh, Lena. I, uh, I started, I actually applied for a grant and I got a grant for um, the community park. Um, and I'm looking at nature, you know, in a new way. Um, I'm starting to see everything differently. Um, I'm, I'm starting to explore. I'm learning about mushrooms. I'm, you know, doing all these things. And, um, and yeah, we got this grant opened up a, a basically installing a food forest at a community park. Um, this is our grand opening. And that's when I met Elaine. Um, so Elaine came to one of our meetings, uh, actually a meeting where they were like going to shut me down uh, because uh, they thought, what's this crazy stuff? You know, uh, they, they thought our cover crops were weeds and uh, the swales were trip hazards. And, you know, we were having a lot of issues. And, uh, you know, and I basically respectfully, um, you know, I, 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 I thanked them for the opportunity. Um, we had an, we were going, a lot of people wanted to yell at the community council people and I decided to go a different route. And, um, Elaine came after that, uh, you know, that talk that day and, uh, offered me a job and, uh, I had never heard of Elaine at the time. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and she said, no, I just bought this property, you know, just down the road and come check it out. And so 
it was like, wow, okay, what do you, what do, you do? Composting, soil science. Um, and, uh, and so I started working with Elaine and I got to meet Penny Livingston Clark, who's a, uh, you know, world famous permaculture designer and, um, you know, work on this land. And, uh, these pictures are kind of sad now because, uh, looking in the background, you know, it doesn't look anything the same anymore, um, here. But, uh, I started working for Elaine. I learned thermal composting. I learned about, uh, so microorganisms and scientific research uh, methods, and you know, it was a uh, it was a new thing for me. I got really into it, and so I started doing a lot of composting. Um, there's my first finished pile that I ever made right here on my property. Super exciting moment. Uh, all the temperatures were right. It was amazing, you know. Uh, and so I was really hooked on on the composting, and uh, and then. Not too long later, and you know, things kind of uh, changed and at the farm there, and I left, um, and I had ended up. Uh, I met had, I met a partner in in Sacramento, and um, we were you know trying to make it work, and uh, you know the only thing that was going to make it work was that I was going to move, and two weeks um, before I had this like decision to make to go move down to um, town. I went to this talk with Toby Hemingway um, and Toby had, uh, had passed away uh, right after this. And, um, and it was like his message in that, you know, meeting was like really all the major connections of permaculture happen in a city. And, um, and, you know, and I kind of shifted my life uh, at that point. I made that decision. I'm going to move down to town. Um, so here I moved 30 minutes down from Berry Creek to uh, this little town called Oroville, and um, I got a third acre lot from 12 acres to third acres, uh, <laughs> and it was a completely blank uh, palette, and uh, here's a guy with some plants and a dream, and so I was able to uh, implement my first real uh, permaculture design here um, on this property, and, uh, and you know, I took that uh, training from Elaine. I started to make connections with the local restaurants. I actually was doing a three times a week uh, food scrap pickup and coffee grounds from all the local restaurants in town. Um, that's what it looked like every day that I would go there three times a week. Uh, I even got human hair from uh, hair salons. Um, <laughs> I was doing all this crazy stuff and I was composting in my backyard um, and, uh, and my neighbors were like, what is this guy doing? And, um, I'm making compost tea and, uh, and I composted so much in the backyard that I needed a bigger space. And so I was offered uh, a lot in downtown Oroville here. Um, and I started getting tree companies to drop off wood chips there and, uh, bringing all the scraps. And we ended up, uh, basically, uh, producing about, uh, 500 yards, um, that year of uh compost or what i'd call inoculated wood chips um that were not quite into the um you know the compost stage but uh were were incredible and um used all around and meanwhile the garden is growing meanwhile the garden is growing and then i'm starting to teach um teaching classes workshops courses right out of my backyard uh kind of living that permaculture you know um dream or uh you know it's just like working right there in my backyard I, I turned my living room into a classroom <laughs> um meeting a lot of great people this is about a year later after I started implementing um and now I'm teaching other people about you know the composting systems and um I've got my first group of graduates um for permaculture design courses so I'm I'm starting to turn out students um there's a Two year later, picture of the backyard, uh, more students. There's a a four year picture of the backyard. Uh, more students started a nursery. Uh, started a school garden program, uh, an amazing design in in Oroville uh, for a K through eight program. Um, and here's the school garden. Uh, about eight years after we started. Uh, we have a huge food forest, um, the largest uh, water catchment system in California uh, in a school. Um, and there's my my yard 
And I think that would have been six years later. So this guy <laughs> changed a lot. And uh, he looks more like this now. And, uh, you know, and life is pretty incredible. This is my other, my last uh, permaculture design course of students who are all really amazing people and um, just made so many friends. Holding that banner up for permaculture um, and my business, Treetop Permaculture, just exploded in seven years uh, being in town. So I had a nursery and um, school garden program, consultancy business, um, a demonstration site. Uh, I started a co-op food program. I ran a farmer's market at one point. I mean, so many things that happened. It was just like a total explosion of opportunity and 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 uh, abundance in like eight years. Um, and so in October, like, I think 20th or something like that, um, I was on a forum and uh, I had been watching uh, John D. Lou's documentaries over the years. My good friend Zach introduced me to him. And um, he there was a particular documentary, Green Gold, that we used to always watch. And um, anyways, I was on a forum and I saw him on there commenting live. And I just said, you know what, I'm going to send him a message. And I had a little um, bio that had, you know, I'd put together with some of my work that I've done. I sent it over, not thinking anything. I got a call. Oh, by the way, this is what most people would know John Liu for, um, is the Lowest Plateau Rehabilitation Project. He covered um, the Chinese government. Um, land restoration project was one of the largest in human history at the time, uh, 650,000 acres, I believe, in um it was, uh, it was massive. And, um, and it really showed the potential of what we can do to restore areas. Um, there's another uh, before and after that project and another. Anyways, uh, I get a call at two o'clock in the morning from Mr. John Liu. <laughs> and he's uh, got a guitar in his lap and uh, a glass of wine. And uh, we, we ended up talking for two hours and he um, was, you know, was just, you know, congratulating me on my work and invited me to join a council of a thing I never heard of called ecosystem restoration camps at the time. Now it's known as community. Um, and uh, I say, yeah, I'm down. Let's, you know, let's do this. So at the time they were planning to meet in February of the next year of uh uh, 2019. And, uh, and so I'm like really excited. Uh, this is really cool that one of these people that I looked up to was, you know, had contacted me and stuff. And, uh, and so I started researching ecosystem restoration. What is this thing? Ecosystem restoration. Um, and you know, it was, uh, like, let's go camping and, um, and restore the earth. And I said, that's really cool. Let's do this. And, um, Two weeks later, uh, the campfire in paradise uh, that burned 153,336, according to the, the numbers, acres, and um, devastated the town of paradise. My daughter, uh, Lena, Lena is, uh, was living in paradise at the time with her mother, um, and I just dropped her off that morning to her school, which was one of the first schools to, um, or the first parts of paradise to actually start to burn. Um, and by the time that I got all these messages, uh, after I just dropped her off that morning, um, they already put up the roadblocks and I couldn't go to her and I didn't know what happened to her for several hours. Um, so, you know, just to give you a little idea of where I was at, um, that day, as most people know, um, here's the burn scar of the campfire. Uh, most people know about the the fire in paradise. Uh, of course, the iconic you know name paradise. You know paradise burned. Um, it was a huge metaphor. Um, and I had rem I remember the conversation with John um, and the, some of the research I did. And there was a video of John explaining what ecosystem restoration camps were um, that I had saw <clears throat> a week before the fire. Or so. And uh, the the tagline he said at the end was, "Let's restore paradise. Let's gather around the campfire and restore paradise." And it was like this huge, whoa, you know, like this is 
this is weird. Okay. And, um, and so I called John the day of uh, the fire and I said, we have to start an eco restoration camp in paradise. Um, it's, it's gotta be the first one in the United States. And, um, and so that's what we did. Um, you know, we had a town that was devastated. Um, and, uh, I started thinking about all the, um, you know, the things that were going to happen now, uh, because of the fire. I mean, you had massive blocks of houses that were just leveled and all the substances that were in those houses, um, toxic materials of all sorts, asbestos, um, and, and so many other, um, you know, heavy metals and, and other toxins, chemicals, uh, that were, that were present. Um, and we had rains coming, I think a week later, uh, after the fire. And so, you know, my mind started to think about like, what are they going to do with all, you know, is, with all this material that's going to run off. Um, so that's what kind of sparked the, um, the ecosystem restoration camp paradise. Uh, I called it campfire restoration project at the, at the time. And, um, we just were trying to create, you know, little solutions for people um, there. And uh, I'll talk about the emergency response stuff here in a little bit. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through these real quick. This We helped schools and created some demonstration sites um, in the area and uh, just a lot of education, a lot of, a lot of really cool stuff. Um, and it's still going on to this day, an incredible group of uh, mostly women led uh, now, um, and, uh, it's, it's really thriving. It's done a lot of good for the community. So, um, I'm fast forwarding now. So I did a lot of work there, um, in paradise. And I finally, you know, was sort of like coming to my burnout mode <laughs> after, you know, a year or so of like, uh, really intense, um, work with the community. And, um, you know, it's just a lot of, uh, a lot of trauma, a lot of hardship, a lot of, um, you know, just, just, uh, heavy, you know, it was really heavy. And as I'm starting to, you know, feel that burnout, um, I, then another fire happened in 2020, two years later that ended up burning down, uh, my family's property in Berry Creek, um, and the forest that I grew up, uh, going and loving, um, just up the mountain from me. So I, um, I basically shifted my gears to be, uh, you know, focused on, on my land. So I gave up my executive director role at, um, campfire restoration project. And, uh, I started to dedicate myself to, uh, helping the community in Berry Creek. Um, so this was a picture before you saw earlier, um, of my house. And, uh, this was it after the fire. Um, and, you know, place like this, uh, this is down by our Creek there, um, now looked like that. And, um, you know, it was, a, a when it's, when it hits you know, home like that and places that you're so intimately connected to it, it, um, it really has a, a different impact on you, uh, more than anything else. And thank God I wasn't living there at the time. Um, but I had a lot of things. It was basically my business property, had a lot of stuff there, a lot of family heirlooms, different things like that. Uh, we lost, it was, um, losing the forest was probably the hardest part. Um, and literally, 99%, like I would say like 99.99% of that forest, every tree um, burned to the ground, every single tree. Um, the <clears throat> North Complex fire, the Bear, Bear fire, um, it was uh, 350, or sorry, 318,155 acres. Um, so exponentially larger than the, uh, the campfire. And by the time it got to Berry Creek, it essentially vaporized uh, the community there. Um, yeah, we started to, uh, you know, through the campfire restoration project, um, called, we called it the bear fire watershed, uh, protection and education program. We, uh, were doing the same thing we did in paradise, which, which I will go into detail here, uh, shortly, but, um, immediate response, you know, helping to, um, stop the, toxic runoff and uh, erosion that would come right after the fire and then giving people other uh, tools and um, education to um, help think of rebuilding and, and uh, getting their lives back. So um, that's when I decided I'm going to, I'm going to start an eco camp. 
uh, up here in Berry Creek because, uh, you know, it's my home and uh, where I grew up and um, and I could have a permanent uh, place that we could host people up here. And so that's what I've been working on ever since. Um, and we're, you know, we're, we put the paperwork into ecosystem restoration camp, uh, for, to be official now as the, uh, you know, another eco camp, uh, in the area. So, uh, I'm really excited about it. I'll talk about that some other time. So all of this, um, really was like, I had, I had been set up um, and I had a permaculture network. I had a bunch of resources, you know, I had um, the education and everything before these events took place. And all I did was apply those same principles of permaculture to this disaster uh, situation. Um, and so something that is, you know, more of a uh, novelty to most people all of a sudden became um, a very needed um, skill set everywhere. And um, I do think that disaster, unfortunately, is um, one of those situations where people start to think differently about everything. <laughs> And, uh, and they start to look at uh, new solutions because they realize all of a sudden that some some, some of the things that are happening um, mainstream are not working and they need to seek alternatives. And, um, and so I'm going to briefly talk about what is permaculture. Um, <clears throat> permaculture is an ethical design system rooted in the patterns of nature. Um, I have this little thing that I, I type out now because, you know, defining permaculture is a whole thing. That's why the, you know, introduction course is like three hours and the um, permaculture design course is at like 72 to 100 hours. Okay. To really even just dip your toe into what permaculture is, but I'm going to attempt to uh, define it here. It's an ethical design system that is used to build stable life systems. Systems that can both simultaneously supply solutions for all the needs of humanity while also benefiting the surrounding living systems. The aim is to not fight what is wrong in the world, but to create a better world in simple and passive ways from right where we are living our lives. Permaculture looks to mimic the patterns of nature in everything we do. Biomimicry. It's more than being self-sufficient, but pursuing the understanding of how the earth and all its natural systems function and how we can mimic those systems on our lands as well as every other part of our life to create stable long-term productivity. Permaculture can be applied to anything from restoration, food production, designing homesteads, animal systems, organizing a home, or even making a business plan. A big concept and theme in all of this is being sustainable, which is all about an energy order. Defining sustainable, it's a system that produces more energy than it consumes and creates enough surplus to maintain and replace that system and its component and its components in its lifetime. So it goes beyond the standard definition of sustainable. Uh, proper term for what we hope to achieve is the term regenerative. Our goal is in everything we do is to use the smallest amount of energy going in to yield the maximum amount of energy from the system coming out. It's about harnessing and rerouting natural energy flows in a system to be used most efficiently, pairing outputs from one element that may be considered waste in its current state to be rerouted as an input for another element therefore creating fewer input requirements of the system that are usually imported from unsustainable sources like money and physical human energy. So we're aiming to create regenerative systems just like ecosystems that we see in nature. Okay, that's a lot there, um, but I hope it gives a clearer definition. Most people think of permaculture based in like gardening. And I want to tell you that it is definitely not that um, permaculture can be applied to um, completely non-living systems, but because we need living systems for almost everything that we do, 
it's focused on that, right? Uh, mostly, but I, I don't want you to lose that um, understanding. So it has ethics, it has principles, um, and it can provide the needs of humanity. Um, so, it, and it's basically just nature. It's, um, you know, it's looking at nature. So we start to be like these forensic scientists of nature, right? Because we want to see what is nature doing? Um, and I always go back to nature with my, uh, you know, whenever I'm not sure about what to do, I say, what would nature do in this situation? Um, so we study things like natural succession of forest system of living systems, right? We're looking at um, canopy, you know, different layers of forests. Um, and we mimic those. And that's how we do things like food forests, et cetera. So the mechanics of life is what we're really studying. Okay. How does this all work? So this is where I think John Muir, uh, Roosevelt, you know, really got it wrong. Okay. Is they looked at like living systems, uh, you know, nature as like this thing, untouched thing, you know, uh, of, of God. But tr the truth is um, there is all these tenders. There's all these things that are helping to tend these systems. And we have to understand there's all these relationships happening um, in nature. And of course, this is what the indigenous people of, you know, many cultures understand um, and have done forever. It's an active participation, right? This is a great book I highly recommend to folks. I'm particularly talking about California ecosystems in my experience, because that's where I live. Um, and this is a great uh, book for folks to uh, gain that understanding. So um, let's talk now about the players. Let's talk about the tenders. Let's talk about what California was like before the pioneers came here, the colonial change of California, okay? You have native peoples practicing good fire. We call it good fire, traditional burning um, on the land that helped keep, you know, the, uh, you know, the forests clear, helped create food for the animals that were there, helped keep the water systems functioning um, so much that that did for, and, and don't, you know, don't think it was like on this mass, mass scale, but around their dwellings, around their um, villages, around where they lived, they did a lot of work. Um, you know, the, the forest is so vast, it wasn't happening on some kind of a mass scale, um, but you got to realize there was a lot of other things that helped tend those areas. And we'll talk about those now. Old growth overstory trees. This is, you know, an idea of what kind of, you know, trees that we had there. We had these massive old growth trees that were providing shade and, uh, you know, mother stock of seeds and everything in the forest. We had the golden grizzly bear here in California, every 15 square miles, um, smashing, breaking up, you know, materials and delimbing the lower parts of trees, dropping massive loads of poop, you know, all the time, all over the place, uh, moving salmon into the forest, um, dropping that critical ocean nutrient, scratching the trees, you know, inoculating them with fungi and things. I mean, their role was so massive uh, in, in the forest. It's what the California um, flag actually is. It's the golden grizzly bear. They're extinct now. Uh, the North American lions, um, you know, the, the cougars, this high expression in our forest. Oh, wait, back, you know, we can go further back and talk about the mastodons that were once here. I uh, often look at a lake bed and I wonder if that was just a place where a mastodon family might sleep. Um, and, you know, you imagine the fire breaks that they created, um, you know, moving on and the nutrient that they would drop and all the things that they contributed to the forest that we, we ended up seeing when, um, you know, when pioneers came. Um, they had a massive contribution to the, the health of the system that was built here in California over millennia. In the valley, there was millions of elk, mule, deer, 
pronghorn antelope. Um, they called it the Serengeti, um, you know, of of the U.S. I mean, it was a massive uh, in, input and, uh, you know, helped keep a lot of the edges of the forest uh, cleared. And, um, you know, it, it was, it contributed to the health. The salmon, huge inputs to the forest um, before the dams, dropping all this, uh, you know, ocean nutrient into the forest, being carried by birds, carried by bears into the forest. Um, I don't think that we quite understand how much we're missing now, um, not having the inputs of the salmon into the forest. Um, the beavers, you know, the keystone species, building dams, spreading water out on the landscape, um, they were so critical. There was millions of beavers in California. They got reduced to thousands um, in a short, very, very short period of time. Um, Here's an example of what beavers do. And of course, we couldn't talk, not talk about the soil microbes. Um, we're talking about healthy, healthy forests back then with all of these inputs that I mentioned, um, all contributing, drop in manures, um, diversity, shade, good fire, all these things created a really healthy soil situation. And I remember even when I was a kid coming up to Berry Creek and you would walk on this, you know, one foot topsoil duff, you know, and it would just squish, squish, squish as you're walking through, you know. Um, and by the time I was in my thirties, you walk through that same forest and it was crunch, crunch, crunch because there, the, the amount of soil life, um, has reduced drastically just in my lifetime. Uh, I personally witnessed this change, you know, um, the diversity went down, the old growth. So imagine this, the old growth trees get cut down. Animals are pretty much reduced, uh, you know, down to almost extinction levels. Some animals had been, ex you know, put ex to extinction. We slash and burned all the, you know, a lot of the duff. And I say we, but, you know, the, the pioneers that came through here and um, they mined and stripped the creeks. Um, massive erosion, massive change for the forest. And this was happening in a short period, like over like less than 100 years that change took place. And these tenders, these, um, you know, the, this food web, you know, just got completely obliterated. Um, and, you know, and we've been seeing the consequences ever since. Um, I compare it to a battery. Um, the forest, the structure of the forest is the battery and the life is the charge on the battery. And we basically remove the charge from the battery and we've been running on the battery ever since. And it, and it started to run out. Um, somewhere around, you know, 2000, 2008, 2018, <laughs> we're seeing the battery is running low and we don't have enough charge to recharge that battery, the life in the forest, the diversity, all these tenders. So that's a context for you, this living web. Um, and, uh, you guys, can you give me a time? We got 10 minutes. About that, yes. 10 minutes, okay. Um, so let's go back here to ecosystem restoration. Um, the first time I met John in February of 2019, um, we were both up at like two o'clock in the morning and we couldn't sleep. And um, <laughs> and he goes, oh, you're awake. Uh, well, good. I want to share something with you, a uh, presentation I've been working on. And it was called the Holy Grail of Restoration. And um, it was about the Sinai Peninsula. And here's a picture of the Sinai Peninsula. And the thing that he pointed out here is, you see this in the middle? All this, these marks here. Looks almost like a heart, doesn't it? In arteries. Well, 
the Sinai at one point was called the land of milk and honey. Um, it was a beautiful forested and uh, area with rivers. There were seven rivers that flowed through the center of Sinai. And um, what he was talking about that night was that there was pollen samples that they discovered in their work of how the winds had shifted at a certain point from a condensation, condensation driven wind um, from the forested areas of the land to an evaporative driven winds uh, from the drier parts of the country. And, um, and it happened like all of a sudden. I immediately started to think of paradise and the winds that, uh, that we've been experiencing in these mega fires. And I followed the, uh, I followed the wind. I went upwind from paradise, which is actually this Canyon right here. Um, and I realized that the largest and longest uh, session of logging had been going on for about 10 years before the fires. And I also realized, huh, it's weird. That's when we had the, you know, we started experiencing a lot of the drought around here. Um, and, and so I started to, that was when my theory began about that. Oh my gosh, it's the removal of these, these critical pieces of forest that uh, actually is causing the drought and then causing the conditions for these mega fires. And there was just a theory at the time. And, uh, you know, and I, I started to look into it more and more. Now, as I'm ready, as I'm preparing for this webinar, I actually um, I actually found this incredible tool. So this is Google Earth Engine. I can share the link. Um, and what it is, is actually you can look at a, satellite, a really high definition satellite imagery of the United States and you can zoom in anywhere in the U.S. about to this magnification and um and see from 1984 to 2022 time lapse. And um, I'm going to show you from 2000 to 2022 here um, real quick as a time lapse. This is Butte County, Plumas National Forest. Um, this is the Oroville Dam um, right here. So Oroville's down here. Berry Creek is right here. Um, and Paradise is up here. Uh, and this is the, or is the uh, Feather River Canyon. Uh, the fire started in the canyon and went up into Concow Basin, dropped and moved like nobody's business into paradise. Um, same kind of situation here for the um, bear fire is that it started here in the Plumas Forest and hit these canyons and just started to pull into the, um, the areas of Berry Creek. So um, I noticed something very startling. So here we go. Every year you're gonna to start to see this area, this thin forest strip of forest, the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, and here's the high desert of Nevada. You're gonna to start to see a connection happening between the valley and the high desert. There's some logging you see on year one, a little bit more. A little bit more. Oh, starting to look pretty thin. And it becomes a patchwork quilt that you'll see. The quilt gets bigger and bigger. There's logging happening north of Paradise here. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, there's logging happening just to the east of Berry Creek. Massive, massive amounts of logging, and it continues to spread. It continues to spread, and they've like getting they're getting greedier and greedier, taking more and more. Now we're getting. I'm gonna move quickly here. 2015, 2016, 2017. 2018. Now this is when the campfire happened. We're going to see it actually. You're going to. It's going to show it here in 2020. Um, is when they updated the maps. 2019. 
boom, 2020. Here's here's the campfire right here. You see that? From here to here. And, and then concentrate on this area right here. We're going 2021 and then boom, 2022. Look at that. And um, and this isn't even showing the Dixie Fire, which is this whole area here. The Dixie Fire was 963,309 acres. A cumulatively, 61% uh, of Butte County has burned in the last five years. And uh, a total of 1,434,780 acres have burned here. It's a lot, a lot of forest. But what you're seeing is a connection between the high desert and the valley, a wind corridor, evaporative corridor. And what I started to do is uh, punch in a bunch of uh, data from the weather models uh, over the historical time. And I can start to see the links between these specific uh, logging events to the evaporation uh, rates changing and the winds shifting. And so what what we're what we're going to be working on now, this is huge, this is really huge. And uh, if we can prove this, what it's showing is that these specific events created the drought, and caused the conditions for these wind-driven fires, these mega fires. And I, I can see the same pattern in every mega fire area. And when you start to think about the lowest plateau, this happened over thousands of years. We are starting to create this situation in hundreds of years in California. We're the canaries in the coal mine right now. Um, there is a very thin strip of forest protecting the valley and part of California from the high desert. And, and believe me, it's not as stable as you might think. We are in a very fragile system here. So this is a great quote by Matsubana Fukuoka is throw mother nature out the window. She comes in the back door with a pitchfork. That's what we're seeing right now across the board, all over the place. Of course, removal of ecosystem, removal of forest, um, the, the continual degradation of everything. Um, it becomes more intense uh, and, and, you know, it creates flooding events, drought events, fire events, um, these extremes. And here's a, you know, a, uh, give you a little picture of all the fires that happened here in Butte County around. So we're like, we are literally like on the ground floor here. We're, we are like the ones seeing it here in Butte County more than anywhere else. I mean, of course it's happening many places in the world, um, but it's just so prevalent here. You know, places that were once this amazing are being reduced to, uh, to ash. So, so what can we do? Um, this is, you know, really this takes a whole nother, um, you know, deep dive, but um, having having a plan, you know, um, educating yourself. If you live in these kind of areas, these, you know, dry, temperate uh, systems, I mean, obviously we're seeing it even in places like Maui, um, you, you know, what you wouldn't expect to have these kinds of fires. So it's not just in the dry, arid, temperate places in the world, but those are more likely. Um, you know, you should be, you should have a plan, educate yourself, um, you know, seek help. If you're you're doing a post-fire uh, situation, you have, you know, just be prepared to amend your plan, um, implement what you can uh, and go at a pace that, you know, that you can work with. Um, it's, it's overwhelming um, and we're trying to give you opportunities and let's see here. So um, I think I got like two minutes left. Are we, are we okay for about two yep. minutes here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So immediate um, immediately after the fire, the biggest things we started to do were um, we're creating staging areas for the kind of materials that we needed um, for dealing with the toxic runoff 
Um, so waddles, you know, everybody got to know the word waddle after the fires. Um, these were a really helpful tool. Um, you know, straw, straw bales, wood chips, lots of wood chips um, are their free product that, you know, all these tree companies actually pay to remove uh, cover crop seeds, um, you know, compost, compost tea, biochar, uh, mushrooms, you know, we were getting sources for all these things uh, coming in. And so we were really focused on, you know, trying to stop the toxic runoff as high up as we could for the homes. So they wouldn't run off into the soils, the water systems and the streams of uh, the area. We created, uh, you know, installment uh, parties, you know, where we would bring in people and, um, and we'd work on, you know, getting this stuff out there uh, in the burn scar, helping secure, you know, areas that were um, where the water would flow out using uh, the natural materials on the land, the trees, whatever we could to help slow down the spread of erosion and, um, you know, and the uh, toxic materials. This is a little infographic that was created by um, our friend Mao after the CZU fires. We did this area uh, in Santa Cruz was really gnarly because a lot of these houses are on really steep slopes and they're right next to each other and they're right on creeks. Um, and so, you know, it's just showing like what this was the house um, and directing, you know, some of the big water flows past the structures, um, the materials that were coming from the structures or burned out vehicles and so forth, you know, just trying to slow them down, putting these waddles on contour, um, and, uh, you know, and adding different biology to them. Now, I'm not getting into the actual, like, biology side of it so much. And I'll tell you why. Because um, when I when I first consulted with, um, right after the fire, I called Eric Olson uh, from Permacultural Action Network out in Santa Rosa, who had just gone through a fire. And his biggest lesson to me was, you know, um, honestly, I would not spend time doing so much with the bioremediation stuff immediately because um they you know they slowed them down they didn't cover as much ground um and really the biggest thing is let's just we need to stop the the runoff of this material because it's gonna it, it's gonna all be contained there and they're gonna come through and remove that material anyways when they do the cleanup um which was like Oh, okay. You know, I know it's exciting and sexy to want to do a lot of the, the, the really great work of bioremediation. And I, I highly agree with that. Um, I think it's great, but when you're in one of these extreme situations, um, and time is a factor and, um, and there's, you know, so many people in need, um, you also have to, you think about that and what, you know, what you can do with the energy and resources that you have, um, we did a lot of stuff like this for educational purposes, what people could do on their own land and stuff like that. But if you're in a massive um, post-fire situation, um, you're not going to be doing this on every property. And that's OK. You know, um, there is new uh, new products out there. I had been envisioning something like this uh, from when I very first started the post-fire remediation work or, you know, uh, toxic runoff stuff is that if we had some kind of material that could just help hold the, um, you know, hold this toxic debris and ash down so it wouldn't run off um, and we could just spray it out really quickly. I was thinking something like paper mache or I don't know, something that would harden up. And uh, in the Maui fire, uh, my friend Rebecca actually found a company uh, who has this very product and it's called soil tac um, and it's a soil stabilizer dust control product and um, I'm a huge huge believer in this new approach now um, basically this is what the stuff looks like um, it can be sprayed out on massive areas the benefit is because there um, you're not having to go in there with people 
and be amongst all this toxic stuff. It takes a lot of work. It's a lot of energy to do that. Um, this will allow you to cap those homes and those vehicles um, for, for that period of time before they come and do the cleanup. Um, and then you can go back and do some of those more, um, you know, intricate projects, uh, the, you know, the inoculation of mycorrhizae, you know, or fungi and, uh, biology and, and doing all these other amazing things. But this gives us, you know, a resource for a lot of people to, to use. Um, and these, like I said, these situations are massive, they're overwhelming. And, uh, I just think it's a really great, uh, product. So anyways, um, yeah, and an ongoing education demonstration. Um, my biggest thing was creating demonstration sites after the fires. Um, and then there's a lot of resources. Um, I am going to share out a, a folder that has all kinds of resources for you, including uh, one a, a document that explains how you can get um, the government to actually fund a lot of this pro this uh, work. And uh, we had the very first of its kind, um, you know, approval of a government funded um, toxic runoff mitigation program. And, uh, and it's now a model. It's, they're not just going to do it though. You have to actually demand it and you have, you have to, um, you know, know how to do it, but we work through our County and we're able to get over a million uh, you know, like feet of material out, um, funded by FEMA, installed by California Conservation Corps. Um, and this is a model that can be applied anywhere in the United States, at least, and I'm sure can be modeled similarly uh, in other parts of the world. Um, and so that was a huge win for us and something I want to share. Um, because again, it's not something that you're just going to, they're not going to just sign up uh, to to do this in your communities. Um, so that's why I'm here uh, to try to educate folks on that stuff. And um, yeah, and there's there's so much more, uh, but I hope that this uh, gives you a bit of a framework. You know, I, I wanted, to, this was the very first of this series. So my big focus was understanding, you know, the the background of why this is all happening. And uh, how we can zoom out and see the context of what's happening in the ecosystems. Um, these aren't just random events. This is a compounding um, issue that's been building up to this point for 150, 200 years, at least in California and, um, you know, and, and many other places based on human activity and, um, and de degradation. And, um, you know, we we have to understand it to know how to respond to to it. And um, I think I'll leave it at that for now. And uh, I'm sure we can pick up more stuff in the Q&A. Um, again, very grateful to to be here and share some of my experience. Um, yeah, this is a new part of our world that we have to deal with. And um, and so we're all we're all uh, on the front lines to learn and to share this information so thank awesome. you so much thank you Matthew great presentation Ashley the floor is yours I'm gonna stop share there we thank go thank you Matthew hi everyone um thank you Matthew for that yeah my heart really moves when I see these photos and the fact that we can do something about it and that there's so many people here that want to do something about it is is very heartening and i'm just glad that you're out there doing this work and teaching people how um so i wanted to tell you a little bit more about the ecosystem restoration communities movement and the introduction to ecosystem restoration course because it's all really related uh Ecosystem Restoration Communities, which, as Matthew said, used to be called Ecosystem Restoration Camps, was created to give as many people as possible around the world the opportunity to learn 
and to do ecosystem restoration. The best way that we are going to do this at the scale and speed needed is to empower and educate and connect everyone around the world that wants to do it and for to take it away from just being something that you can only do if you have a degree in ecology. Uh, so we have 65 ecosystem restoration communities around the world now and they are created by local people, run by local people and are really grassroots and they, they join the movement because it's a chance to connect with the network and share and exchange ideas and knowledge with each other, as well as preparing fundraising proposals together, um, promoting, we do a lot of promotion of the ERCs around the world, connect them with our network that we have, which is extensive through John and everyone that he knows. And we create courses and trainings that give people the chance to, to learn this stuff, both at the restoration community sites and online. Um, and yeah, it's it's a really growing world since 2016 when the ERC began. The interest in this, obviously the need has, has become much more evident and the amount of people that are getting involved has really grown with that as well. And it's, it's really, really exciting. Um, and one of the things that I could really feel was that we have, been missing the chance to learn the real foundations of ecology and ecosystem restoration because it's something that we weren't really taught at school. Most people weren't taught it at school. And so one of the ways that we're gonna change our society is to give everyone that information and for a knowledge of ecology and restoration to be foundational in everyone's minds. And that unfortunately, is not the way our society has been structured. And so we're trying to do something about that. Um, because yeah, we need to kind of go back to basics really to, to start on the first rung of the ladder to be able to do this sort of much, much needed ecosystem restoration work around the world. Uh, and yeah, being able to do it with the Soil Food Web School is really a real privilege and honor because they do their work so well and their courses so so well and so I'm really pleased that we've been able to create this this offering and it's already been taken by hundreds of people and we're getting really really great feedback and we're just about to launch our first in-person in introduction to ecosystem restoration workshop in Mexico for people to put into practice what it is that they've learned online because online learning is great it's really accessible um but the real learning happens on the ground. And so the partnership between us, we can offer with the school, the online stuff, and then at the restoration communities themselves, you can go and implement what it is that you have learned. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to share with you really. And I think now we've got a video for anyone who's interested in this eco introduction to ecosystem restoration course. Yes, thank you, Ashley. As someone that took the course and as an environmental scientist, I would say that worth every single second. The Soil Food Web School has entered a new chapter. We are deeply honored to be partnering with the Ecosystem Restoration Communities Movement to develop a series of courses designed to help our students make an even bigger impact. The Introduction to Ecosystem Restoration is the first in a series of courses, and it is designed to give our students a better understanding of ecological principles and how ecosystems can be restored at scale. Together with the Soil Food Web approach, this powerful combination will optimize the impact our graduates can have on the Earth. You'll have 12 months to complete the Introduction to Ecosystem Restoration online, and we advise students to commit to around 80 hours total. You'll learn about the Earth's natural cycles and how they can be repaired, the services that ecosystems perform and how they operate, the different phases and stages of ecosystems and the restoration continuum, how species interact with each other, how to restore ecosystems back to full health and functionality, how to increase biodiversity, how to measure the impact of an ecosystem restoration project, and much more. 
The course is delivered by ecologist Paul Morris, who is an expert in the fields of botany, ecosystem restoration, and regenerative farming. With over 27 years of experience, Paul is a certified ecological restoration practitioner with the Society for Ecological Restoration. His extensive experience in restoration ecology and conservation biology makes him a leader in the design and planting of restoration areas. Paul also heads up and runs Earth Connection, an ecosystem restoration community in Mexico. You'll have the opportunity to interact with Paul and other members of the training team in monthly student webinars and in the dedicated student forum, where you'll be able to ask any questions about the course content and get to know some of the other students. This is a great opportunity to network with other people in the community. For a limited time only, save 10% off the Introduction to Ecosystem Restoration now through December 15th. Finance options are now available so you can pay at your own pace with a firm. Register today. Okay. So, uh, if you have more questions about the course, you can always email info at soilfoodweb.com and our great staff will guide you with more details and information. So just to review, the Introduction to Ecosystem Restoration course is on sale now, and it's uh, $1,260, and the offer ends on December 15 of this year. Remember that it's available until midnight of Pacific time zone. So do not hesitate to contact our staff before this time if you need help or any support. Okay, so now it's the time to start the fun with Q&A. Uh, I will leave, I will read the questions and leave it open for each panelist to chime in as you guys see fit. So I'm gonna start with the first one from Morgan. Thank you, Morgan. Please share some of the specific strategies that you have used to manage land in post-fire situations. Would you like me to try to? Go ahead, go okay. ahead. Um, do you mind if I share my screen real quick? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I will share a few other slides that I, I didn't um, and do here. So, <clears throat> The biggest thing that um, we try to do um, is what's called a sector analysis um, in any area that we go into. So what we're looking at is um, what are the energies that affect the site? Uh, wind, water, um, you know, elevation changes, right? The topography of the land. Um, where is the dry winds, the fire winds coming from? Uh, where are the, you know, the the cold winds, all these things. This is what we look at in permaculture. Um, and we come up with a design. Like here's a here's an example of one property design that I did um, post-fire um, up here. So what we did is we addressed um, the, the concerns, you know, that um, that were happening here and how to deal with like, it's going to burn again. There's no doubt about it. Um, and so how can we, can we address that immediate, is you know things like whether this this is a you know a swale here right or like a ditch um on contra that catches organic matter that flows down the hill like erosion and things like that and it helps pacify the water but that doesn't have to be a swale it could be um you know just a real simple like what people would call a water bar it could be um, a waddle it could be a log you know logs it could be wood chip piles straw bale um, piles, et cetera. So, you know, um, I mentioned the immediate things was like toxic runoff, um, from wherever the burn structures are, the houses, the vehicles on the property. We want to basically cap those, make sure that that material does not flow any further, um, on that property. And then we're starting to deal with like the bigger erosion issues, um, like what you know things like this but we're also looking at how we redesign the land uh for those you know whether it's a landowner or or community space or whatever um 
And, you know, how can we actually increase the lens of water on that land? Um, so that way, and, and prevent the runoff of all this topsoil, you know, that's left. Um, because unfortunately, like in a, in a good fire, you know, um, it's usually great. Like the, there's not as much erosion. Um, it didn't destroy like the top layer of seeds that are usually a higher expression. What I'd say is like a, uh, more sophisticated, um, uh, set of seeds, you know? Um, but if it burns below that, like in these bad fires, you know, these high wind fires, heavy, you know, uh, intense temperatures, then it burns off that layer. And now you're dealing with, um, the potential for massive erosion. Um, and so you need something to pick up, uh, that material. And so, you know, anything like this really works well. Um, in between there is what we call a net and pan system. Um, you know, it's one of the techniques of permaculture is you create these like basins essentially that help uh, catch water that can be applied in different contexts. Um, and, uh, you know, then we usually do things like cover crops and um, this is like, you know, and we plant trees um, specific to that area that also helps slow the water down. Um, and it's, you know, it's a lot about design. Um, this is another property. We've been working with grazing systems as well. Um, the green in this, uh, represents a grazing system around a property that we created. And we're talking about holistic grazing, fast, you know, intensive or moving them often, um, that kind of thing. Because again, we're trying, we have to mimic these uh, elements in the forest that aren't, aren't there anymore, right? Like this, the the amounts of of animals and things that used to do this work for us for free aren't there anymore. So we're having to um, bring in elements uh, to mimic those missing elements in the forest. So we're we're maybe putting our own um, species of plants for for a short period of time, and this is on you know, on properties. I'm not talking about the greater forest, right? I don't believe in trying to change that too much. Um, but where we dwell around our, um, our homesteads, I think it is, you know, that's where we can experiment with, um, with different things. Because what I've, ex what I've learned is that if you, if you work with whatever elements that will want to do that work, whether it's domesticated animals and um, species of plants and things that uh, want to work hard, you can create a healthy system and then you can uh, eventually remove, you know, transition into a native system easier. Um, and so this is, these are big conversations for like, you know, um, you have to be careful on, on the approaches of those things, but um but I've seen some really great results um, in, in that. And actually, you know, I'll have to I'll have to go to uh, in, in a little bit to another slide. I have some before and after pictures of um, the property that I've been working at. But that's uh, at least I'll give you you know a little something for now. And um, and we're still learning, you know. But slow slowing the water down, um, making sure the organic matter and the seed banks that are there don't run off. Um, and, uh, and then mimicking the natural elements that aren't present. Mm -hmm. Any of the other panelists want to compliment? Okay. So I'm going to... I just added some thoughts on, on what I would do, what I would think would be the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Bearing in mind that my, you know, I have a lot of knowledge, but I'm learning from experts all the time and not really getting to practice it very much myself. But from what I've picked up, I would, that's would be my approach, but Matthew's the actual practitioner here. I'm <laughs> just chiming in. This is the beauty of process, right? Different ideas, different perspectives, getting together to find the best solution since there is no one solution fits all. So I think that all perspectives are super valid. So on this sense, uh, can you guys see my screen? Okay, so the next question. After the fires in San Diego, one species dominated the hillsides. 
maybe mountain laurel. It looked like a monoculture for the next five, seven years. Should we be intervening in managing the diversity? Thank you, Charles. Who wants to start this question? I'll go ahead and you know, give, give it a whiz. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember some of those sites along the, um, the course through there. And I think probably the that particular plant um, seed already in the ground possibly and not as affected by the high temperatures um, where it was perfect to get them to germinate and grow. What we might want to do in those kinds of situations is fly over or, um, or you know, use one of those little small size whirly guys that fly over and drop seed of of um you know a, a whole mixture of seed and that should be a restoration prog process that occurs almost automatically uh, immediately um after a burn like that so we hold on to the soil so it, we don't have the erosion we don't have um you know the whole side of the road come zooming down and wipe out four or five cars that happen to be going by at the time um, so I think we do have, we need to suggest that at least to the states or to the federal people that here's something you have to do just in, uh, in terms of, um, saving people. Um, we could make it something like, um, seed that was treated with the appropriate sets of biology so that we would be inoculating, uh, those microorganisms that are so very important um, when you're dealing with burn systems like this. Um, we've done a lot of um, working with what does a person do when they're faced a, a burned property. And we were have worked in some places where the temperature reached, um, you know, uh, uh, as high as um, something that would melt different kinds of metals. So uh, these are really high temperature um, requirements for making it through the fire. And the, the temperature was down to, I think it was six, 60 feet that temperature change was noted. Um, I don't remember the, you know, how, how, how fast it dropped or anything. It's too long ago. Uh, but I think we have to treat our our burn systems just exactly like we would treat a place where somebody went in and practiced um, tillage and wiping out uh, almost everything. Um, every time you, you till, you reduce your um, organisms in your food web by at least 50%. Um, mm -hmm. I think a fire has, you know, barely affects anything at is a little harder to a little hotter um, birds for longer when you get to the point where you're still at 60 degrees Celsius for um, a long period of time when it finally cools down, you've got to go back in and put seed in. Um, and it needs to be as soon as possible so that uh, the seeds can germinate and start to grow uh, and protect um, the soil, keep the soil in place instead of having it run down the hill. Yeah, and I, I, I would just uh, add something to say that, you know, this is why it's so important to have these kind of um, systems going where we have fires, you know, to like have those native seed banks um, locally, to have resources. Everything that we used in these post-fire scenarios are things that you would do all the time. Um you know, in permaculture, like I, I, I use these all the time. I mean, we're always trying to slow water down. We're always trying to accumulate organic matter. You know, we're always trying to um, bring up the life systems. Um, and so, you know, having those in place when you go into a fire, and that's why I was able to be effective in a lot of these is because I had a lot of those systems in place. I had a lot full of wood chips. I had connections to seeds. I had, you know, I know where to source all this stuff. And, you know, so like getting familiar with this now, and I have to say people that are in 
an area that is potential fire hazard. And if you're in a pre-fire, you know, area, I call it because it will burn at some point, like really have to realize that. And you're in the best scenario. There's so much uh, positive things that can happen uh, when you're in a pre-fire scenario. I mean, to thin that forest, you know, you have so many products, good products that would come out um, because I, logging isn't bad. It's the wrong kind of logging that's bad. Um, it's you know, the highly or- disturbing uh, mechanical things that they do with you know, no paying no attention to the countryside. Yeah. Right. It's about the the um, scale of which that we do this work, I think. We um and just another example of kind of you've got to be there and assess what's gone on. We uh, in the Paradise Fire, we had at least two um, places that had just applied a compost <clears throat> tea, a compost extract to their property, to all of the foliage, the all of the soil in their garden. They had just applied the um, the uh, the um, fire was the next day, and the fire went around all of their homes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, all of their homes and all of their property and left these islands of everything still green there, which is something we should be aware of. And when you're in high danger for, um, you know, a fire coming out and taking everything, including your house, um, we want to have people um, think about let's go out and apply a compost tea. Let's be ready to do that so we could save our house and enough times with examples like that we would get everybody putting in a treatment so to pre- prevent um the their their property from burning right i love when the panelist predicts the questions you guys are covering one after the other so thank you <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, what what I think a big thing we have to uh, realize is that while these, you know, these disasters, these massive fires and all the loss of life and all the loss of infrastructure and people's homes and lives, it, it's so devastating. Um, but but also it creates an opportunity that normally doesn't exist where you you have an opportunity to think about how you want to redesign and rebuild. And you can do it in a different way. We can start to use materials that are, you know, building materials that do not burn. You know, we can, we need to look at alternative um, construction. You know, they're using, there's a lot of commercial stuff that's happening, more blockcrete, you know, like um, hemp, hempcrete, aircrete. There's so many different um, commercial products, but some of the the most equitable ones are things that have been around for thousands and thousands of years, like Cobb, um, natural building uh, models, and things like that. And uh, you know, we've been trying to really work on getting examples um, into local ordinance. There was a straw bale home in Paradise that survived the fire. Um, and, uh, you know, that I, I'm actually looking to do a, um, a, you know, a little film on that because, um, I have heard it rumors and rumors and I finally actually found the uh, connection to, to this place so I can go and, and document that, um, <clears throat> you know, and being able to utilize water systems, uh, gray water, roof runoff, rain catchment, small ponds, you know, all these sorts of things in the right locations, um, they can be a game changer. Um, some of the only properties that I, the houses had survived had, um, big water bodies, um, near them. In fact, the entire, uh, Lake Madrone community just down the street from here, um, uh, you know, had such, uh, low, uh, fire damage and it was so much cooler in that area, um, because of all the water present. And so there's a lot to be learned uh, from all this and, you know, how we can redesign. We can't just rush to build things the same way as it always has. We have to, you know, we need to take this opportunity to see a, a potentially different future. So 
So thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Elaine. There is a lot of other questions that we can cover. This is just the beginning. We're going to have more webinars on this topic of ecosystem restorations in 2024. So this is just the first wave. Uh, I want to uh, remind you guys that the introduction to ecological restoration course, it's on sale until December 15. So do not hesitate to contact our team if you have any questions. I want to uh, extend a huge appreciation for the panelists and also for the beautiful staff that we have behind helping us to keep these webinars live. Thank you, everyone. And in the name of the Soil Food Lab School, we wish you all an amazing end of the year. We appreciate each and every one of you to be here with us in every webinars. And we, uh, sorry, <laughs> getting emotional here. And we hope to see you guys again next year. So go out, spread your knowledge, share information, and come back to learn more. Any new last comments, panelists? Not going to come just... back until a whole year from now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just we're passing over to the next year. Sorry, uh, Matt, go ahead. Oh, no, uh, I just I wanted to tell everybody that's um, on. I did post a uh, on the comments a link to what I call it's called the post fire uh, restoration uh, share folder or post fire share folder. Um, and it has a ton of resources in there for everyone. Um, and then I, maybe the Soil Food Web School can um, send it out uh, to folks, too. I'm not sure if we could do that. Um, but yeah, I know there's a lot more questions. So um, people want to reach me. Um, you can see there and I'm sure they can send my information out there to folks. So thanks again uh, for the honor of doing this. Thank you guys so much. So I think we can send out a list of uh, the information that you want because it's all recorded. So we can send it out along with, uh, you know, it will be uh, uploaded later in our YouTube channel, so you guys can watch this presentation many times as you want. Okay, so thank you, everyone, and thank see you. you next year. <laughs> Take Don't care. Don't forget to click that like button, button subscribe, subscribe to our, to our channel, channel and, ring and ring the notification, notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos. videos.